All right, everyone. Hello, welcome to Mikey Likes You, the greatest health and fitness podcast on the planet as decided by me. Really isn't all that matters. Self-confidence, the self-esteem. It's a Q&A episode, so let me get right to the cues with some A's. K picks, anything big planned for number 20? Number 20 what? Sorry, dude, or gal. I don't know what, the 20th of what? Uh, Let me see. No, I don't know. Used pace suits. I've been doing my workout plan that you built up for me and it's been great. Well, thank you. Uh, But I still struggle with tiredness. I can't do caffeine, so any recommendations would be great. Um, Well, always, look, if you're constantly fatigued, examine your sleep. And I know it sounds trite because uh, the answer, (laughs) you ever, like, if someone has any malady, right, in the real world, if they have a headache, uh, if they have a stomach ache, if they're tired, if they're overly anxious, nine times out of 10, um, your mom's friend will be like, you're just dehydrated. Because uh, you, it, like, you can say that shit and usually it works out. You can fill any little hole. And in the health and fitness world, in the wellness world, like that's what sleep is. And it sounds so dumb. But the reality is, is that most of us sleep like shit. And in the day and age of like constant screen use, it's even worse. But everything that you probably value, fat loss, muscle gain, longevity, mood, cognitive ability, it's all not kind of affected by sleep. Lack of consistent solid sleep dramatically affects all of those. Um, A little bit of uh, anecdotal kind of support to this is that, you know, I was at what could be looked at as like peak athletic age. I was uh, late 20s, early 30s, you know, 27 to 32-ish, where I was doing a morning radio show live from Los Angeles from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. Now, we go live at 5, that means I get there about 4.30, which means you get up, God knows when. I was getting up at 3.34 in the morning. Um, But I was also doing Love Line at night from 10 to midnight. So, and during a lot of this time, I was working through the day on various TV things. I was not getting a lot of sleep. And then when my television stuff started to take off a little bit, and granted me a little bit more financial liberty, I was able to move on from the morning show, right? So I didn't have to start, I started not having to wake up at four in the morning. Within like three months, I gained like 20 pounds of good weight. I was leaner and I was 20 pounds heavier. I couldn't believe how different I felt mood wise. My whole life changed. Um, The depression that I'd suffered from, it, it didn't go away, but it lessened so dramatically, Um, and that's just one kind of anecdotal story. Trust me, analyze your sleep if you're constantly fatigued. Now, another thing is, is like, what if you have a really stressful life outside of the gym? You could be eating as well as you want, be be sleeping, but if you're going through a divorce or you work a crazy job, you know, it's a really high pressure job. If you have kids, a new kid, you know what I'm saying? There's, There's a lot of factors. And at some point in our lives, we all kind of deal with a extreme level, uh, uh, an exaggerated level of stress. That, that, there's nothing you can do about that, unless something that's causing you stress is unnecessary. But, you know, professional stuff, your kids, your romantic relationships, your friendships, your family, that, that's not exactly avoidable. Try to take out toxic things in your life if, if you can. Um, and also regulate cortisol. That's the body's natural stress response. <sighs> there are a collection of things you should do before you go and you try and just look for supplements. Meditation is huge. It's absolutely huge. It's hard to do, I understand. It's not hard, the practice of meditation is not hard. 
But sitting down consistently every day and doing it is hard somehow. But do it. It really is worth it. Develop a meditation practice. Now there's apps. Um, I, I'm a big fan of Ziva, Z-I-V-A. Um, I recommend it greatly. Uh, this Emily Fletcher put it together. She is a wizard and she has done it. She's really done her homework to create a, a, an approachable and relatable program that takes all the tenets of Eastern traditional meditation and applies it to kind of fast paced Western lifestyles. Uh, the transcendental meditation, if, you're, if there's a transcendental um, meditation center near you, it's great, it's great. I mean, and if you can really develop a consistent meditation practice, that will make a huge difference. Stay hydrated, and if, if all else fails, uh, there are some supplements out there that can help you regulate cortisol. Uh, and dieting alone will elevate cortisol disproportionately. But Cortisol by MPA Supplements, Cortisol, S-O-L-V-E, so corti, like cortisol, but S-O-L-V-E at the end, cortisol, is, a, is an excellent, excellent product. I, I recommend it greatly. I have no financial ties to MPA supplements, um, but I believe in that product. I take it myself. Um, that's, a, that's another kind of last ditch effort. Mike Mall, my friend Mike Mahler has a great line of supplements as well, and he makes a product called RED, Real Energy Dominator, R-E-D. And that also is caffeine-free, stimulant-free, collection of um, Ayurvedic herbs and adaptogens that really do help you kind of regulate the negative aspects of stress internally um, in, in, in a very healthy, positive way. So you could check that out too. Duo Duo 72 Mike, I listened to the last Q&A that turned out to be a great listen, even though it was not a Q&A. True. Great job, man. One of the many reasons I like listening to you. It's all real talk. Hey, thank you, dude. Um, and what he's allude or he or she is alluding to is that I planned on doing this Q and A last week, but I was going through some shit, you know, and nothing. And it's not Crimea River. It absolutely is first world problems. Um, and I and I want to go. I want to make that very clear um, because. I don't often listen or watch my podcast, but the last one I did, it was so kind of vulnerable and, and it was very sincere. And it was all about my kind of struggles with self-esteem and depression and the things that I was going through. I was feeling very, very, very dark. I'm always someone who flirts with absolute darkness when it comes to my thought process, you know, suicidal thoughts uh, pretty frequently. And I, I, I struggle, I struggle with a lot of those just extreme dark feelings. Normally, I'm able to flood that darkness with light and everything kind of is copacetic, but I went through this phase as, you know, you do from time to time where I, I wasn't able to combat it properly and I was really in a dark, dark place. So I decided to just do the podcast about that because concurrently at the same time, I was noticing that all of these fitness influencers and wellness people and self-help gurus that you see in this space, which is, you know, digital health they're all, the dudes are all doing this like faux alpha thing where it's like, I work nonstop. There is, there's no such thing as tomorrow. Grind 24 seven, alpha male this, alpha male that. And I was like, this, this is fucking bullshit. It's just bullshit. And you're giving false hope to these like poor young men who are looking up to these guys and they're saying like, well, how come I'm not bulletproof like that? And I know, because I don't fa fancy myself like the most alpha dude, but I know real alphas. I hang with them. Special forces, uh, professional MMA fighters. Guys, they have nothing to prove. They, they, they live it. They are that. And every one of them has no problem exposing the fact that they're human and they're vulnerable, um, which gave me great, great, relief and, and pleasure to, to see these guys who I look at as being just tougher than, than like, than seems possible. It seems like they're, you know, they're the character in the action movie from the eighties. I'm like, these guys, but they're like, no, nah, man, it's just, I'm like my kid, this and that. And I feel really bad about it. And, uh, I'm just, you know, I didn't make 
projection last quarter at work and I uh, starting to question if I'm even good at it, you know? And I'm like, fuck, good, man, oh. And I'm not, I'm not happy, I'm not, there's no schadenfreude. I'm not uh, taking pleasure in their, in their suffering. But I am taking pleasure in the fact that I'm like, oh, they're human, they're vulnerable. So that's kind of a long story into what I did last podcast. And uh, I thank you, Duo Duo. It was episode number 100. Go ahead and check it out if you haven't. Uh, Redani05, what do you do when you experience shoulder pain in one arm in the weight room? Do you take more rest days, change the load, reps, get it looked at, avoid flat bench? I say all of the above. Here's one thing. Look, let me go be very clear. I like bench press. I like the barbell bench press. I do the barbell bench press. But don't be married to it. Because unless you're a competitive power lifter, there is absolutely no reason to barbell bench press. It is a tremendously uh, precarious um, exercise because it does put your shoulder in a... Anyone who's anyone who has any muscle, they all will tell you about the time they hurt their shoulder or they tore their pec bench pressing. That is, it happens. It's the way that, the biomechanically, the way that that exercise works. There's ways to get around it, but then analyze, like, is the juice worth the squeeze? It isn't because it's not one of the better um, exercises for stimulating pectoralis. When you can get just as much, if not more, out of doing dumbbell bench press, uh, any type of dumbbell variant of it, or certain machines and cables. Now, I like to do the bench press because I can feel it, and, and I've kind of dropped the weight so considerably that I can alter the, to do more of an old school bodybuilding bench press where I go wide and I bring it up higher on my chest. My elbows are flared. Um, I don't go heavy on the bench press. But either way, the point is, is like don't, you don't have to bench press to get a big chest. And frankly, it's not a very good, if we're just looking at pure hypertrophy, it's not actually that great at stimulating the chest uh, muscle fibers. So do it, avoid it if you're having shoulder problems. Um, Another thing is that elbows, knees, I was just having this conversation with my wife moments ago. She's in Los Angeles filming something and we were on the phone. She's like, oh, my elbow is starting to flare up and it's, I don't know what's going on. I was like, here's the reality. The human body was not put on this earth to do repetitive movement with tension. Talk to any plumber and he'll tell you about his or her um, bum wrists and elbows. Talk to any construction worker, you know, like from swinging hammers. Ev practically every major league pitcher gets the Tommy John surgery. Most boxers have problems in their shoulders and their lead hand from jab, 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 jab thousands of times. And they, 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 we're just not designed to do that. We're not, our knees are not designed to squat heavy weights and our shoulders aren't designed to deal with overhead press and bench press and, and eventually like shit's got to go. Now, does that mean don't do it? No, of course not. It means that just understand that that kind of comes with the territory. Um, yes, if you're having active shoulder pain, back off from the heavier weights. And then also attack it. Do get it looked at because it, maybe you tore your fucking, some type of ligament, you, have, you ripped your rotator cuff off. Who knows? So if you can't, if you have health insurance, go get it looked at. But, you don't always need surgery. And the knees over toes guy has proven that with the knee. And the same thing goes for your shoulder. I had horrible shoulder pain to the point that I couldn't, I couldn't throw a punch even like at, at, at pads, like with no resistance. I couldn't raise my right arm to do it. Um, and if you get, you know, a lacrosse ball and you do your due diligence, I actually put up a, uh, I'll be showing you a video that I put up in regards to posture but it, it involves the same movements that I've been doing to rehab my shoulder for so long. And it's about a, a comfortable range of motion and getting articulation in all the surrounding muscles and the connective tissue there so that you can move through different ranges of motions in different planes without any pain, right? And oftentimes when you fuck something up on the, you know, your front delt, it's oftentimes with imbalance with your rear delt. You know, you, you throw your low back out, it's oftentimes like something going on with your hip flexor. That's the way the body works. It's really elegant and beautiful that way, but you gotta analyze it from a more comprehensive package. It's not just about like, oh, hit the fuck, fucking massage gun on the shoulder because my shoulder hurts. It's a part of it. But 
really work on the the like kind of boring but useful physical therapy to the to the problem that you're dealing with. Um, exaggerated ranges of motion with nothing with no weight that would be strenuous to you become huge become huge because you do get locked into kind of like a limited range of motion a truncated range of motion through extreme levels of tension when you're doing resistance training so being able to go extreme range of motion you know the shoulders of um, the example i'm giving but um you know the squat is the is the best example for me is that you know when I go into squat and I squat heavy, I squat heavy. I'm going to parallel, um, but no, no need to go deeper. And that's, that's for going balls to the wall. But I spend complete other workouts where I'm going extreme ass to grass with really light weights. Not because it's gonna help my legs grow anymore or give me any type of metabolic boost because that exaggerated range of motion makes it so much easier and so much healthier for me to go heavy in the kind of training range of motion. So those are the best pieces of advice I have for you for shoulders. But at, look, you spend enough time in the moving iron, uh, eventually shoulder, elbow, and knees, it's going to happen. And it doesn't necessarily mean you're doing something wrong. But always keep it, you know, put it at the top of your priority list when it does happen. Chris Snipes, 1106, advice on supplements, BCAA, creatine, etc. Yeah, don't, do, don't, buy, don't waste your money on supplements. Creatine monohydrate, plain creatine monohydrate. Don't let anybody sell you any ethyl ester peptide bonded bullshit. Crea Pure from Germany it has to have the Crea Pure label, meaning it comes from one bulk provider in Germany that you can rest assured that it is actual creatine monohydrate because there's a lot of bunk bullshit out there, uh, mostly from China, although we can't say that, you know, like coronavirus. <laughs> uh, now, fuck that. Fuck China. Uh, and here's a, like, here's a, I know this is not a, a political uh, show. And uh, I, I make a conscious effort not to because you get enough of that bullshit and just bombarded with it. But I grew up in fucking Shanghai, okay? I grew up in the east side of Los Angeles. Uh, for those of you from the LA area, I grew up in the San Gabriel Valley. In a town called, it was, by all intents and purposes, I grew up in Pasadena, but I grew up actually legitimately in a town called San Marino, San Marino, California. Uh, now, the surrounding cities and San Marino themselves, you have no fucking concept how Asian my neighborhood was. You have no fucking concept how many Chinese people, Chinese families, I grew up, like, it was so normalized to me that it's almost inconceivable to people who grew up in other parts of the country. I'm not kidding. The Alhambra, Monterey Park, the surrounding cities, and then in my hometown, you drive, there are plenty of stretches that if I were to blindfold you and drop you in there, you'd be like, wow, I didn't realize we were going to Beijing today. What is my point in telling you this? Well, I have a deep, sincere, authentic love and appreciation for all Asian culture uh, because I grew up with so many Korean, Japanese, Chinese, Thai, uh, Filipino friends and family. I mean, really grew up and, 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 and went to so many fucking church uh, groups and 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 funerals and stuff that were almost exclusively Mandarin, and I would go to restaurants all the time, where I was one of like three non-Asian people in there, where everyone's speaking Mandarin or Korean, and if I didn't go with someone who spoke fluently, I'm not ordering. Okay, I like that was my life. It was very normalized. Because of this, I got a very good understanding of how people from China who come here, who gave to me a real deep, sincere appreciation for Chinese culture. One of the most misunderstood cuisines. It's an amazing, beautiful cuisine. And most of us just kind of associate like 
orange flavored chicken, you know, and fried rice. And it's like, well, no, no, no. Fuck, Chinese cuisine is amazing. Thousands and thousands of years of incredible artists, writers, the amount of, uh, the amount of oppression from surrounding countries and the way that they were able to develop. And I love it. I really, I love Chinese culture. But the current regime of China that runs China, fuck China. Fuck that shit. Like, fuck them. And fuck the way they exploit the world around them and, and just shit on human rights, pollute the earth, and then fucking middle finger everyone about, uh, about all of it and s practically enslave people of their own country. Uh, that shit. Fuck that. Chinese people, Chinese culture, I love. I really do. Uh, in this, and I, you know, I, I just, I get so angry because people pussyfoot around China stuff in the media because they spend so much money on American media in every way. All these NBA players with their fucking tail between their legs, like, oh, well, Love that, love that. I mean, but we just have to do what we have to do here in the NBA to please fucking China. And all these Disney and all these Universal and all these companies and movie corporations who have to take out black characters and gay characters and change things in animation to please China and Russia because they spend the money. Fuck that shit. Anyway, so yeah, China makes a lot of fake creatine. And they fill, you know, because they, they provide the bulk supplements for a lot of supplements. Um, and a lot of the creatine is junk. So get the Korea Pure so you can rest assured it's real. Creatine monohydrate, fish oil, vitamin D. That's about it. Anything else, you should be getting it from your diet. And if you're at an extreme level, you know, look into things like essential amino acids. <coughs> But the, honestly, that's about it. There's no, I can't think of any other reason why people would need to go buy a sup, like a, like a performance supplement. I take pills and stuff, but I don't take any real supplements. I, 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 the only thing I take are for health purposes. I take fish oil, I vitamin D. I take, uh, I like a glucosamine mix for joints and stuff because I'm fucking old and I hurt. Occasionally, I'll fuck with some collagen protein, but usually I just eat, you know, meat off a of bone and shit, bone broth. Uh, so, yeah, honestly, don't. There's no, there's no scientific or practical need for any of it, and it costs money. Save that money, get extra sleep, buy yourself some steak and apples. You'd be better off. Natalie Villalobos, O2, what birds are you hunting? On the video, I said I'm, not, I'm on a bird hunt. I'm not hunting them. I'm looking for them because I have a bunch of birds here at the farm. The chickens are cool. Chickens, they're just hanging out. Uh, they find shade when it's really hot. Uh, I have little, my wife and I put little water bottles, little canteens and stuff throughout the farm. And they'll go and they'll look and them. Uh, either that or they're in their chicken coop with their eggs. You're like, oh, thank you, chicken. The fucking guinea fowl, they're just, they just fly all over the place. They just go all over. Sometimes they leave the farm. Days. And then they come back. And you're like, oh, hey, there you are, shithead. Where you been? I was saying, uh, as I was making the video soliciting for this Q&A, uh, I, I was like, I'm on a bird hunt right now. Cause I was walking around trying to find my fucking guinea fowl so that I could go pick up my daughter from school. And I wanted to, before I go, I wanted to make sure like, I was like, oh shit, where are all, all of them? You know, I have, we have 10 or 11 of them. I couldn't find any of them. So I was like, oh, I'm a little worried here. So I'm gonna go on a bird hunt. I wasn't actually hunting them. Zach D. Don D. Donato. How do you deal with overbuilt obliques? This is actually a good question. To clarify, muscle overbuilt. 
I feel like they make your waist look blocky. They absolutely do. Um, Charles Glass, a uh, guy who's considered the godfather of bodybuilding, always says, wear a belt for every exercise. Um, now, you may only be useful for things like good mornings, deadlifts, squats. But the reality is, is you can use a weight belt almost like a corset. And it keeps things tight. And it keeps things from expanding outwards. Because that will happen. Strength. Strength is almost all about building up the muscles around the spine and hips. It is. You can have fucking wiggly little arms, little noodle arms and legs, but building up, you know, the glutes and area around the hips and the small muscles around the spine, that's where most strength, true strength, comes from. Now, there's a difference between speed strength and explosiveness, agility. That, that's different. Power, you know, a lot of that comes from the feet, and you can talk about grip strength. I'm talking about, like, pure, absolute strength. It comes from the muscles around the spine and muscles around the hips. Now, getting great levels of strength in those can expand those muscles, and it makes them look wider. So here's, start to learn to wear a belt. Learn to do the vacuum, the vacuum pose. Um, you know, old school bodybuilders you do, where you see them, they suck in their belly deep, and, and, and it will, their transverse abdominals will get stronger, and you have better control over that. So you don't get that, you know, buff guy gut, where you actually don't have a gut, but it just, everything looks blocky and big. Now, for the obliques, avoid training. No one, like, the, I see these people, and I feel I like I'm not the guy to go up to someone and offer like, hey, can I give you some tips? The only time I'll do that is if I see someone squatting or deadlifting like shit, and I go do, I, I, and the only reason I do it is because I don't want people to hurt themselves. But never just because, like I, I, I don't wanna be that guy. So I just watch in silence and I'm like gritting my teeth because I see people do side, weighted side bends and stuff thinking that they're gonna tighten up their, their obliques and make it, don't do that. Hypertrophy to this musculature here will build them up like it would your biceps or, you know, your quads. <clears throat> Avoid any weighted oblique movements. There's some debate about whether you can do exercises to bring them in. The obliques, the side of your abs there, the little spare tire muscles. Now, if you have truly, and this guy, Zach Dodonato, looks looks pretty healthy, he looks pretty ripped. He's a, he's a healthy jack dude. So I don't think it's a matter of like having a pooch. A lot of people confuse the fact that like, the best thing you can do to tighten your waist is go on a diet. If, you are, if you're over 15% body fat, there's nothing in the exercise world that's gonna solve that. You have to fucking go on a diet, a real diet. Um, once you get to a certain level of body fat that you still have, uh, a wide waist, that's, you gotta look at two factors. One is your training, maybe you're doing things that are gonna kinda keep that area looking blocky. Two is just genetics. I'm not a guy who has a, a, was genetically gifted and having like a long torso and a tight waist. If you look at, you know, Michael Phelps or something, there's, there's, Michael Phelps can deadlift all the live long fucking day with no belt on it, he'll still have a tiny little waist, okay? There's a lot of genetics to that. I, I, Arnold, Arnold, even though he uh, was amazing, Body. His physique was incredible in his peak, um, mid to late 70s. Arnold was not gifted with like, from the front, he did not have a very tight waist in comparison to his contemporaries like Serge Nubre and things like that. Um, but you, you can't deal with a certain, if you have just kind of a wider hip girdle and, and blockier area there, you do, I do. Not all of us can be like Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor's fucking tight little teeny little waist. Um, so, you know, look at genetics and then secondly, look at your training. And then again, here's the debate part. There are people believe, especially like old school bodybuilders and stuff that like, you know, twists, rep after rep after rep, will do that, will tighten that area up. I do them and I feel like it's worked for me. I mean, I know I can measure myself. I don't know how much of that is just when I get, I'm dieting, you know, I'm getting leaner 
and how much of that is the actual exercise. Also, it could be just placebo because I'm doing, I do that for like five minutes a, a day. I put a broomstick, some really light, and I just do twists. And I do it for two reasons. One, I'm not gonna do some, waste that much time in doing something that I don't know works. But what I do know is it does help provide rotational kind of dexterity which is great for any type of athletic movement. And I you know, spend so much time lifting weights that I do like to have mobility in a rotational plane. So you can do those. You know, Charles Glass doesn't even use a broomstick. He just puts his hands here and and you can feel it kind of hitting those oblique areas. So you can explore that. But definitely wear a belt. People should wear a belt. Wear a belt, get it as tight as you can possibly comfortably get it and, and keep that on even when you're not training deadlifts and squats and things, because that will, well, that will aid in keeping things tight. Mark Tyndall, 75. I often have my hip and knee joints pop at the bottom of squats, no matter how much I warm up. Is this a problem? Knees, probably not. Um, I've heard two, I, I wish I could remember who it was, but these were <sighs> kinesiologists and the people who are in there, they weren't just meatheads. You know, like some people have like a popcorn pop when you when your knees bend. Other people you have like it almost sounds like Velcro. That's just I did not know this. I always thought like oh oh fuck because my knees go like pop when I when I bend them. I always thought it was like bad. Like I had arthritis or something. It's totally natural. It's totally normal. It sounds horrible, but it's a the thing. Some people's knees do it. Some people's don't. So knees I wouldn't worry about too much. Hips is kind of. Mm, it's kind of sketchy. I would look at, and also analyze your squat form. If you're squatting too narrow, analyze your squat. Here's another thing. I'm glad you brought this up. <clears throat> I see a lot of people film themselves at the gym that aren't looking at their form. And you're a fucking douchebag. Fuck you. Or, or a, a stupid whore. But if you're filming yourself doing an exercise to analyze your form, it's really important and more people should do it. I don't care if you don't feel confident because you're not jacked or whatever. If you're squatting, if you're doing something complex, deadlift squats, any type of Olympic lift, like, you should film yourself. Film yourself, watch yourself, analyze people who do it right. Send it to, if you're, if you're in my top tier and you're not sending me form videos, you're missing out. I film myself and send it to other people, friends of mine that are professional powerlifters or professional bodybuilders, things like that, because <clears throat> you, you can never get too good at shit and there's always way, and just sometimes I film myself, especially squatting, because I wanna know, see little intricacies and make sure I'm doing it properly. Film yourself, make sure you're doing it properly. Make sure your knees are tracking over your feet don't let them cave. If your knees are caving on the track, out inside of the track of your feet, there's something going on. You need to change your stance. You need to correct imbalances. Um, and that's often the case when people have hip problems from squatting. Because if you get in the squat and in, in the right position, it shouldn't be doing that. So maybe just analyze your squat form, make sure that you're sinking in the right direction and that your knees are tracking properly over your toes. You know, in a perfect line. If your toes are going like this, your knees are tracking exactly over kind of the middle uh, webbing of your middle toes there. Um, and a good cue is to start with the tripod. Make sure that the heel of your foot, the outer toe, little pinky toe, and your pointer toe have complete control of the ground and you have equal stability on all three points the tripod do you think it's safe to bring out a cock pump for workout 2022 from wine cellar 37 i mean i yeah i'll be honest i don't know much about cock pumps i don't know much about any cock machinery and i love cock really i do not just mine. I enjoy, not, I'm not gay. I'm very, uh, uh, and there's nothing, like I, I also don't mind if people are like, that's gay that you think that way or that, I'm, I'm oh, fine, okay. 
but I do, I, I appreciate, I mean, I, I like a nice meaty cock. I, 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 I tip my cap to thee if you are a man with one. But I've never been into any type of, and I, I am obsessive about touching mine, but uh, never thought, like, I need an apparatus for this. Whether it be to, to pleasure myself or to enhance it, I don't know anything about it. But I also don't feel like as a, if you want to use one uh, Wine Cellar 37. I love that Wine Cellar 37 is asking me about cock pumps. Like if, if wine, you told me his name is Wine Cellar 37, I'm thinking of this, you know, Lord Fauntleroy and this sophisticated fellow with a monocle talking about, oh, it's a fine but oh, I believe it's a Rothschild, 1974. Tremendous vintage with notes of lilac. And he's like, uh, how about my cock pump, brah? I'm gonna break that out for my for my couple sets and reps. But I'm not sure it's effect. I, I can't imagine that just increasing the circular and like filling and suctioning your cock is gonna do much. Unless you enjoy it sexually. But I, again, I'm not wonder. I just I can't really see any big advantage over my hand, you know? It's like when chicks are always like, I'm going to put on a sexy a a lingerie and an outfit. I'm like, oh, that's great, but it'd be better if you were just naked. You know, like chicks have this idea, like, I think because girls are, they, 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 they're a little bit more sophisticated intellectually than men are. And so they have this idea that like, I'm gonna do this sexy dance for you um, and I'm gonna put on this lingerie and my high heels and it'll be sexy. And uh, the whole time I'm thinking, I'd, how about just let me put my penis in your body? That'd be, that's, that'd be much better than any other option. And any outfit you're picking, like just be naked, be way better. And that's how I feel about any cock apparatus. I'm always like, well, my hand's better than that. I, <clears throat> twice I had, I, I, I used an apparatus with my penis to completion, both times uh, it was more for people's entertainment than it was for my own satisfaction. For my 21st birthday? Yes, no, no, tw 20th birthday, uh, my friends got me the Kobe Thai vagina mold. She's a vintage porn star, and she made a like a latex mold of her vagine, and they gave it to me. And we were at this bar that I don't think's around anymore called uh, Miyagi's on Sunset Boulevard in West Hollywood. And I opened it there, and I took it in the bathroom there. It's very fucked up, and I was so screwed up. I was like peak me, party me, and I. I had sex with it in the bathroom and like finished in it and then left it there in the stall. And then one time I was at K-Rock on the Kevin and Bean show and someone sent us, I think fleshlights, sent us fleshlights and to make the guys on the show laugh, I took it in the bathroom and, uh, arrived in it and I just threw it away like so I never really have done that for my own sake a Zezel a Zezel G GV as a truck driver that goes from California to Texas and I do a five to six day sometimes food prep can be challenging and then 
I have to resort to Subway, same with working out, and your experience in travels and such. What would you recommend in this setting? I'm trying to stay fit and the issues above hinder my progress the days that I'm actually home. Thanks in advance, Mike, or anyone who can respond. It's a really good question. And you know, I, I don't, I, I, I wish, I've never been in a situation where I, I, I work you know, five, six days straight like a truck driver works. And for those of you who don't know, not like I have experienced driving truck, but I, I, I do have friends and family that do. Like you don't, it's not like when he says he works five to six days straight, it's not like five to six days straight with a couple hours in between or even parts of the day where they, like they're constant, they're driving the whole time. If they're awake, they're fucking on the road. Um, I don't know how you avoid that in situations where you're just incapable of staying active. The food prep thing is absolutely interesting and legitimate. Um, I do think like that's a situation where a, f a protein supplement could be of tremendous benefit. And then just avoid, kind of go look, the, you're the type of person, and that's a lifestyle where I do think like a ketogenic diet is probably something overall better. It's a better choice because your level of activity daily is so minimal when you're working that you can just go five, six days eating, you know, eat, eat your protein and fat. Keep your carbs at practically zero if you need to. It'll keep you fuller. You won't eat as much. And you don't really need carbs because you're, you're sitting for 20 hours a day, 18 hours a day for five, six days straight. Now, and then when you get home and you can spend time uh, tr actually training, then go back to it and then you can carb up ar around your workouts, uh, five, you know, pre and post workout, hit up some carbs and elevate it and then go back to just a more ketogenic diet uh, at other times of the day. So that when you go back on the road, you can cut those carbs out. And that will, I think, be effective. It's an effective choice for someone who, who is doing that much traveling and working with utter incapability to kind of stay active in any way. The food prep, that might take care of a little bit of it too, because then you can, you do, you stop it, you know, whatever fast food joint, you can just get no bun burgers, avoid fries, things like that, you know, don't have any sodas or sugars. You can get you know, the meat and the cheese, and then you can go to the diner, the truck stop diner, and you get eggs and bacon. And you can go to Subway and you get you know, a bowl without the bread, you know, and just have the meats inside and deli meats and stuff. So it's a good way to avoid kind of the inactivity for such prolonged periods to take its toll. Um, and then when you do, hopefully you have long stretches of time where you're not working, you can go after it and really hit the gym. And, and um, you'd be surprised if you're consistent in your time when you're at home with training, you can go a lot longer stretches than pe most people think. You, that you kind of, everything goes out the door in a couple days, it's not true. If you're consistent with your training throughout the year, you can have uh, a week here and there where you actually don't deteriorate in any way. So why the move to Texas from Texas Haas? Truthful answers only. Um, it was a better fit for me and my family, absolutely. Uh, I have a big, beautiful farm home and I've always dreamed of it. I've always dreamed of having land, open land and farm animals and, and my ability to kind of roam and be in nature on my own property. That was always my dream. I grew up in the Los Angeles area, so it just wasn't reality for me. Uh, you know, for if you have an acre, if you have a half an acre in LA County, you're Steven Spielberg. I mean, you have to be balling to have that. And I have eight acres here. And I'm not Steven Spielberg. I have chickens and guinea fowl and a bunch of cats and dogs and uh, the donkeys on the way, you know, and uh, a horse stable and everything. So, I mean, we're, we're filling it out. And my daughter, I open the door and uh, go for a walk with my dogs, no leashes, and I don't have to worry about anything. Um, and my daughter, I was so guarded with everything that my daughter did, especially in Venice. I mean, she couldn't walk down the street. And no fucking way is she going to walk down the street, even like the corner 
or go over to her friend's house down the street <coughs> just on you know on her own now i she'll just leave just go out on the land and i, I have no idea where the fuck she is for hours she's going out camping and hiking and looking in nature and i'm like oh, okay enjoy and it's very therapeutic she loves it i love it i love that aspect of it um I needed the isolation. The majority of my life being in like urban settings, it was suffocating me. And I always planned on this. This was my plan from the beginning, but I thought I'd be like in my 70s. Uh, and then COVID happened and it really kind of forced my hand a little more. You know, my wife and I had sold our, our house, like the kind of the, the big dream house, you know, and banked a lot of money from the sale of the house, in Ven our, our first house in Venice. And we were renting, kind of figuring out what we were gonna do. And then COVID happened and it was like, fuck, you know, fuck this. And so we just went somewhere where kind of, it, it's, of course you can't really, it, it, unless you move to Siberia, this isn't the case, but it seems a lot more like we're detached from what's going on in society here. We have our own sufficiency, not only when it comes to like the food we raise and things like that, but we're, we're self-sufficient in a, in a social setting. Um, and that, you know, that's it just, it's what I was looking for. And I never wanted to pressure my wife to move away um, but she was a little bit more reluctant than I was. Um, and then I think the lockdowns and everything just kind of made her see things in a different way. Uh, another thing is like professionally, uh, for my wife's sake, she's an actor and it, I think she always justifiably felt like she had to be close to LA. And then we realized pretty quickly that that's just so not true. It's not. And my family still live, my family of origin still lives out there. So if I ever do go back, and I, you know, I've had to a couple times, and my wife now is currently there, and she just got a new job. <coughs> Winchester's on CW, the uh, prequel to Supernatural. It's awesome, I'm so excited for her, she's so excited. And um, they're starting filming now, so support my wife, Winchester, CW, for all you Supernatural fans out there. great universe, the supernatural universe. Um, so yeah, and she's working like crazy and it's, and it's just, we love it, you know? <clears throat> um, and, and I, I uh, I'm always really reluctant to kind of like talk shit on the entertainment industry because I think it's, it's so passe and it's for the most part, not true. Like I know so many actors and producers and writers and shit that are great people that aren't detached, uh, godless super libs that live in a bubble that don't know what it's like to be a real person. Uh, most of my friends that are in the entertainment industry at like at various levels, they were all regular dudes and regular chicks and they happened to make it big and they wanted to be writers, they wanted to be actors and they made it. But before that, yeah, they fucking swung hammers and they served tables and they, so they're not detached. They're not like these people who are just born, to, you know, their dad was Harvey Weinstein or something. So they, I mean, I know a lot, but at the same time, I will say like, I got tired of like the entertainment industry culture. It was, I just didn't, I, I don't like it. I don't fucking like it. And I don't, and a part of it is, is I'll admit, uh, it's a prejudice. Like most people, I think we live in a society that like has celebrity worship. And I'm kind of the opposite where I have to look beyond my own prejudice because if I meet celebrities, I automatically don't like them. I don't like the idea of celebrity and fame and shit. And I have to go beyond that to then work, as opposed to most people when they meet celebrities, they're automatically in awe. And I think that's why I uh, was good on the red carpets, you know, and that's, you know, entertainment, entertainment. Um, Access Hollywood used to send me to red carpets a lot. And they were like, you're so comfortable on there. I was like, yeah, cause I don't, I don't give a fuck. 
I don't dislike them, but I, my heart rate doesn't change when I talk to Julia Roberts when, in, you know, from when I'm talking to the, the, the camera guy that I was just talking to five minutes before. I'm not shaken in that way. And I'm not saying I'm not prone to that because fuck, man. <laughs> There are people, you know, like, uh, I'm, I'm just as geeky as anyone. I mean, I met, when I met Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, um, Tommy Lasorda, uh, big time LA athlete celebrities. I get, uh, I'm sad. And <laughs> I'm, I'm like, oh, oh. and not, not always just even LA ones. Um, you know, they could, they could be legends of any, even miserable, horrible, shitty fucking Celtics and San Francisco Giants. I, I met Kevin McHale and I was, you know, I told him, I was like, I'm a diehard Laker fan, but I, it's, it's such an honor to meet you. And, you know, so I, I don't see it that way. But yeah, even fucking disgusting Celtics and putrid San Francisco Giants. Uh, so yeah, that's why. That's why. Ironically, I can't tell you how many fucking celebrities and entertainment people I've just, by utter chance, I've kind of befriended out here, my wife and I. And I, I mean, literally by chance, like you just go, we were, I was at a farm, like supply store in middle of fucking nowhere. I'm not, you know, not, not in like downtown Austin. I was out in the sticks. And uh, James Vanderbeek's there, right? I started talking to him. Nice guy ever, right? And I'm not talking about anything. And I just mentioned, oh, it's like my wife. Uh, I, she worked with you, actually, on Dawson's Creek. And he's like, who's your wife? And I told him, Bianca Kylie. And I'm like, now we're chilling. And he's like, oh, dude, you guys, are you guys are out here? Yeah. James, I ran James Marsden the other day. Chit-chat with that fucking guy. It's impossibly good looking. James Marsden in person is like, whoa. Whoa, holy fuck, you're good looking. Nice guy, too. So there you go. In a nutshell, that's... I, I wanted out of things that made me feel pressured in any way. Uh, and then I had kind of simultaneously made the decision that I was going to try to be my own boss. I still have ideas and I develop TV stuff and I'm... I, I've found success and I've been happy doing it. Um, but I really doubled, I got out of terrestrial radio and I, you know, I got a lot of great offers to do, to host morning shows and stuff. And I just don't want to do that anymore. So I made the conscious effort, like I'm going to move out. And then I was like, I'm just going to create my own content. Uh, so I didn't feel like the pressure to stay by Los Angeles, you know. And there's a part of me, like, at first I was like, fuck, because I, I, I don't want to name names or stations or anything. But I got a pretty lucrative offer to not, like, explore that. They're like, here's your job if you want to come host our morning show. I'm like, I don't want to do that, man. It just seemed like in 2004 it was the best it was the best. Like 2003 when I started in radio to 2011, Kevin and Bean and Loveline and stuff. It was, it was amazing. It was everything I ever dreamed of. I, people were paying me money and patting me on the back for being a shithead. It was the first time ever. I was like, people are pat telling me I'm good at something and I'm just being myself. I'm just making fart jokes and I'm busting people's balls. And I'm being a goofball. I'm being, I'm putting a lot of intense effort into stupid shit. And I love it. And it was great. And now it just slowly got to the point where I was like, I, what do you mean I can't say that? What? What do you mean I can't tell that person not to do that? I remember this, this chick called into Loveline. This is towards the end when I, before, right, like a couple weeks before I quit. Chick called into Loveline. She's like, hey, um, so I'm addicted to. Do you hear my daughter? 
think she's having a nightmare. She was screaming. It was like gibberish. All right. I think she's down again. Okay. So it was like three weeks before I quit, and uh, I was increasingly becoming more and more frustrated. Because it got to the point where, like, everyone's like, you can't judge. That's just, that's her truth. That's his truth. That's his life. Who are we to judge? I was like, I'm judging. It's an advice show. And you're calling me up for advice. And you're making terrible, horrible decisions. And I'm telling you that don't do that. And now you're upset at me for saying that. But, it, like, the straw that broke the camel's back, I remember this chick calls. She's like, I'm 19. She was young, I remember. She was, I don't know if that, but she was young. She was not, she was a teenager. And uh, she's like, um, I'm addicted to drugs. I think it was pills, like oxys. And uh, like, you know, after high school, I'm, I'm, I'm out of high school and I don't want to like go to college because I just don't feel pulled to it. Uh, and, I, and I just think like I can't get my life together. I was like, hey, listen. I was young and a drug addict and aimless. You just got to power through. Like you have value. And she's like, no, but like I don't want to, you know, I'm thinking about like what I want to do with my life. And I think like right now I should just like, I, I think if I had a kid, if I had a baby, it would give me like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. Okay. Don't, that's a ter- That's a, not a solution. Becoming a parent is not going to, yeah, it gives you purpose. Believe me. I just had a kid. This was, you know, right after I had my daughter. Uh, but it's impossibly hard. Impossibly. She's like, yeah, but I really want to. And I was like, don't. You're, this is, stop. Listen to me. And Drew's telling, Drew's telling the same shit. He said, uh, well, what do you do for a living? She said, I don't work right now. I live with my parents. And I said, okay, well, how are you going to get money? for the-? She's like, I'll figure something out. I go, that's not a good idea. And then she goes, I go, what about uh, who's going to make a baby in you? She's like, well, I'll find a guy. I was like, oh, whoa. <laughs> You're, this is, and I, so then I just like kind of, have a case because I remember I'm also on the radio so I can't just be too diplomatic at some point I just gotta be like listen bitch and I said I fucking tear into this chick I was like it's so selfish that that's your solution you're such a little narcissist you're so entitled that like something just needs to be bestowed to you and you're gonna think like you're gonna create someone's life someone's life that you're responsible for so that you could feel better about yourself you're fucking terrible uh so then like Three calls later, we go to commercial break, three calls later, another girl calls up. She's like, how dare you judge her for her decision? It's her life, and she, if she wants, she's a beautiful woman and independent. And I, I was like, oh, fuck. And then I was just like, shut up. Get, uh, get off the phone. I hung up on her. And I'm thinking, like, well, these people are the outliers, the girl telling me, she's just telling her truth. I was like, how about the truth? Like, fuck her truth. But then I go on Twitter, like, later. I'm driving home. I get home. It's, like, 1 in the morning. I look up on Twitter, and, like, there's, like, a n- bunch of people flaming me. For, I was like, wait, what world am I living in? And it wasn't that way, like, two or three years before that. And so that's when I was like, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do my own shit where people can't say, uh, I'm a drug addict with no money who lives with my parents and doesn't have a man, uh, any partner and zero stability and I want to have a baby because I want to. Uh, I would like to be able to tell that person to fuck off. Advice for beginning intermittent fasting from Klaus3030. Klaus from Bulo3030. My advice for beginning intermittent fasting is my, be my advice for anything that you're starting when it comes to health and fitness. Stick with it. And commit to it. Stick with it. Commit to it. What do I mean by that? If you're going to do intermittent fasting, set your fucking window of eating. Always a good rule of thumb for guys is 16 and 8. So 16 hours of fasting, 8 hours of an eating window. 
Don't fuck around with it. Don't do that five days a week and then on the weekends you drink till four in the morning and then go through the drive-thru on the way home and then you're like, ah, but I've been good. No, no, no. Fucking stick to it. Do it for six months. These people was like, I tried keto. Uh, I go, how'd it work out? They're like, ah, I don't know. I didn't really go. I was like, well, how long you been doing it? Like, oh, I did it for two weeks in, uh, in uh, December or so. And it just wasn't for me. And I was like, well, what, what, nothing, nothing means shit in fitness unless you do it for a long time. Really. Uh, people that are like frustrated that they don't get the results they're looking for in like three or four weeks. And I'm like, what? I think you're 28% body fat as a male. You're not going to be under 20 anytime soon. And it's going to be a long time before you see your abs. And the same thing goes, it's like work training, you know, like training and stuff. It's like, you're not going to be jacked in overnight. I don't care how much Testo Boost 9000 you take and how much protein powder you drink. You're beginning keto, you're beginning intermittent fasting, you're beginning a weightlifting program, you're beginning anything. Really commit to it, do the work. If you're gonna intermittent fast, you're gonna do an eight hour window, you fast fucking 16 hours, not 14 hours here and 13 hours there and 16 hours there uh, and pat yourself on the back on the days that you do. No, no, fucking commit to it, do it and do it for a while. <clears throat> There's no half measures with this shit. Other stuff in your life, uh, maybe, you know, extreme levels of talent, genetic gifts, you can get away with stuff. I don't have any of that in any facet of my life. So you can't have half measures. I can't tell you how many people, um, you know, I either help in my private life or professionally like through the Patreon and uh, they go, yeah, I'm just, I'm frustrated because I'm not seeing the results. And I go, okay, well, uh, break down this last week for me. I go, uh, you know, I see her prescribe 220 grams of protein for you. Um, and uh, you're like, yeah. Um, I've been consistently hitting 175. I've been consistently getting 170. Um, so th there's that. But, but my workouts have been great. I go, so wait, but I prescribed 220. So get 220 every day. You've been getting one set. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, well, here's your workout. No, um, yeah, you skipped two workouts in two weeks? Yeah, yeah. I was just tired, you know, pop partying the night before. And then I go, well, how's your, how's your steps? <coughs> 10, I prescribed 10,000 for you because, you know, you have a very inactive job. I've been good. I've been at least getting 7,000. And so my point being is that, like, do the shit. Commit to it. Commit to it. Don't go two weeks of doing something with like mediocre effort and then get tired and frustrated because it's not giving you what you want. So then you go and you change up and you start all over again with some new exciting program or some new exciting fad diet. You want to do intermittent fasting? If that's going to work for you, it helps you control calories and intake better, fine. You're not that hungry in the morning. I'm not naturally very hungry in the morning, so it seems to work out. Do it. But do it. If you're going to do it, do it. Do it right. Do the work. Commit to it. That's my best advice. Ah, here we go. Trey thinks. <clears throat> Trey thinks always asks good questions. Do you have any good pointers for improving your posture? My girlfriend is always getting on me about my forward sloping shoulders. Totally good question. Very relevant, very applicable. I think most of us suffer in some way because we spend so much time sitting at computers, but mostly guys, guys and guys who have always spent time lifting weights because uh, we are just in love, love with beefing up our chests, right? And every high school gym is full of dudes who want to know what they bench, but haven't fucking ever done a dead, uh, deadlift, a row, or a chin up ever. Don't even start on legs. No one trains legs until they're oh, until they, until way too late. Um, but everyone's like, 
bench, 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 push-ups, push I do, I've been doing 100 push-ups a day, bro. But I go, yeah, but what the fuck are you doing for your back? You know, either way, your posterior chain is so neglected and you're, all, you're overwhelmed with like your front delts and your chest. So you end up like this. I put a little video together of my kind of routine to deal with my posture because I absolutely, I genetically, A, had really bad kind of thoracic mobility as far as like my mobility this way. And then on top of that, I had done the damage of like focusing so much on bench and push-ups and whatnot <clears throat> when I was much younger. So here's what I've done to try to rectify the problem and to really work on developing my posture and standing up straighter. Check it out. Hello. Um, I wanted to take a moment, make a little video and some demonstrations of some of my favorite mobility and strengthening exercises to deal with bad posture. Trey Finks. Uh, who always gives me really good questions. Thanks, dude. He asked, how do I deal with my rounded shoulders, which is something most of us deal with from our lifestyle of sitting like this. Um, Got to open those up. And it's not just a matter of strengthening kind of the upper back area, which is a component for sure. Uh, it's about getting more mobility and dexterity in the front part because most of us have spent a lot of time training the muscles we can see in the mirror and neglecting our posterior chain. So... There's the mobility component, and then there's also the strengthening component to balance things out. Um, an often overlooked factor is the thoracic mobility, and that's something that took me a while to understand, so I'm gonna show you. I like to start off with pullovers. There is a huge difference between doing a pullover for mobility and doing a pullover for um, hypertrophy. I like to do both. But this one, you want to keep your arms very straight, elbows locked, and really push that mobility. I'll even sink my hips down a little lower to get that big stretch. Boom. So, get the bench right where at the line where your neck becomes your shoulders so that you can really focus on getting some more kind of breathing room in that upper chest with over the top movements there. The dumbbell pullover in the fashion with the straight arms. And also you can use, you know, a, a wider implement like a a light barbell or things like that, but that becomes much more of a lap exercise. Keeping your hands closer together um, does focus on that thoracic a little bit more. And again, there's a difference. You know, choose a really lightweight, something that you have complete control over, and you can actually push that range of motion. It gets too heavy, then it starts to become dangerous. This is not a uh, exercise to get jacked and tan. This is an exercise to get more mobility and dexterity in your upper back. All right, the next thing I wanna do is I've already created more movement in this plane. Now I wanna create some strength there. So I do the wide. Everybody knows kind of, or should be familiar with um, face pulls uh, to kind of get that uh, parallel to the ground, that vertical plane, or excuse me, so horizontal plane when it comes to movement, and I'm, I'm gonna move on to that next. But this is the often overlooked aspect of posture and developing good posture. And that is the, the more perpendicular vertical plane. So I like to get the um, rope extension, which is something that's kind of crucial in this one, because um, you want to be, be able to spread those arms. I like to get it about six inches above my head to provide me the ability even I went too heavy there. This is, again, not something that you can really move a lot of weight through. But, <sighs> trying to keep my lower back as stable as possible, flexing my abs almost like I'm gonna get punched, and just focusing on that Y movement. <clears throat> Hitting that plane of motion that I was just opening up, developing some more strength in the musculature right along the spine where your neck meets your traps. 
that really gives you a lot more ability and comfort to keep those shoulders open. All right, after so, that, I like to move the face bolt, but I do them in a little bit different fashion than most people who are just gonna go and kind of pull them to the eyeballs. I like to do it so that I'm pulling the rope, the base of the rope to my forehead and then extending my elbows outward. So I always try to keep my elbows perpendicular to the ground. Excuse me. No, excuse me. I always try to keep my elbows parallel to the ground and leading the movement with my elbows as opposed to my hands. Start here and then. So again, focusing. I'm kind of making that box and again, leading with my elbows. To hit that upper back region all across the T-spine. After that, then I'll finish off with shoulder dislocates, which sound a lot more gnarly than they really are. Start with it as wide as you need to go, almost like a snatch grip. And then start working without removing any part of your hand. You know, don't let your hands pull off for comfort. Get it all the way to the butt and back and forth. That's a full rep, okay? Now, as that gets easier, sometimes even within the same workout, if you're really stiff, it might be weeks of just practicing it at the widest grip possible. Start to move the hands closer and closer together. And the more you have the ability to keep your hands close and go all the way through, like again, keeping the palms completely touching, even on the outside. Not only does this provide incredible mobility to the front delts, which is pulling us forward. And again, we want to create more mobility there to allow the strengthening of the T-spine to help pull our shoulders back. But it gives you the ability from the bottom of your spine to where it connects to the bootay all the way up to the traps. It gives it the ability to practice keeping it open because sometimes it just takes, it's really uncomfortable because we're so used to kind of relaxing like this. It's really uncomfortable to just even be like this. So keep it from the side. And then I'll pause sometimes in the most uncomfortable area. Just giving my shoulders, my front delts, a little bit more of a stretch. There you go. And I practice those things as much as I possibly can. It does seem to help me find more comfort externally rotating the shoulders and standing a little taller and prouder. All right, there you go. Thank you, Trey Thinks. You're always asking good questions. <clears throat> Let me try that again. Thank you, Trey Thinks. You're always asking good questions. How should we vary set and two schemes? How, this is from Mark Tyndall, 75. How should we vary set and two schemes? I've used five by five for about six months and really like it, but I'd like to add in some higher volume training for hypertrophy. Should we do a block of five by five and then switch to higher reps? Can we mix up and set the rep schemes during the week or even in the same workout? Thanks. Well, that's a good question. And I think the, the best, consistently the most effective way to do it is to program in blocks. Periodization over the long haul has proven to be the most beneficial because then you can really focus on either force development, strength, or hypertrophy. And if you start to mix the two, yes, some people have found great, great results doing that. And I'm not saying you shouldn't because if you're the type of person that can do it, especially if you're not practicing a sport or in, engaged in any like athletic hobbies, it's a way to maybe not overcomplicate your training. But a, a great way to do it would be to do, break your body into two parts, upper body and lower body. Train each twice a week, so it's four total workouts. One upper body strength routine of lower weights, higher reps. One of lighter weight in higher rep range. And then the same goes for lower body. And you mix and match. So you go lower, lower body strength, 
upper body hypertrophy, lower body hypertrophy, upper body strength, and that's how you work out your week. It's a great way to do it. Um, I've never personally found a lot of success doing that. Um, and that's just because my life kind of throws physical wrenches at me so much that I like to be able to say like, all right, for the, till, till summer I'm focusing on strength. And then when I get there, it's like, okay, now I'm gonna introduce some more hypertrophy. And then I, I also feel like I respond better to it because I've spent kind of the cellular activity and the chemical activity has been so geared towards just beefing up for so long that then when I go back to strength training, um, you know, I, I, I have this almost like a, a more of a internal motivation to go and lift heavy. And subsequently, when I go and spend three months just really pumping big weights, when I go back to do more strength endurance stuff or hypertrophy stuff, I'm doing, you know, if I was doing squats with, uh, you know, last time I did hypertrophy, uh, hypertrophy block, if I was doing squats with 275 for 10 to 15 reps. Now I'm doing it with 315, you know, because I've spent so much time kind of beefing up my one rep maximum that uh, the entire the in the entire wavelength gets, you know, my my ebbs and flows gets raised totally. So that's the way I like to go about it. But you can do it within the same week, um, in the way that I suggested. Stan Efforting kind of broke down that type of training for me <clears throat> a while back, where you mix strength block and hypertrophy block in the same week with A, B, A, B, as I, as I pointed out. All right, I'll call it a day there. It's a good show, I think. Solid show. I like what I've done. Uh, sign up at the Patreon, please, if you're interested. I have three tiers available uh, that give you different access to different things. The top tier being like, I'm here to work with you in any way possible. I am here for you. I have custom programming of nutrition, diet, lifestyle stuff, habits. And then uh, I also am posting a lot of stuff that's relevant and germane to the podcast. And if I wanna get more geeky about a certain topic, I can do that all in the Patreon. Check it out, I'm Mike Catherwood on Patreon. Please <clears throat> like, subscribe, comment, do all that fun stuff for this podcast. It really helps me out because it helps with the algorithms on YouTube and then both in the, uh, on YouTube and then in the audio podcast stuff. You know, just play around that. Give me the likes, give me the comments, subscribe, do all that stuff because uh, it makes the machines think that I'm more important than I am. And it helps me. In this crazy mixed up world that makes you think that nobody cares, remember one thing, I do.